We will begin today in Haggai chapter number 2 at verse number 10. We've actually got two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, that are urging the rebuilding project under Zerubbabel and Joshua to move forward. And each of them have their own unique way of presenting God's insistence that this needs to happen now. And so Haggai, in uh, chapter number 2, uh, verse number 10, resumes with this. On the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius. So that means that we are about three months into the rebuilding project. Uh, and it is now, let's see, ninth month, uh, 24th day, is going to be somewhere in December of 520 B.C., right around the middle of December of that year. So on that particular day, the word of he who is came to Haggai the prophet. Thus says he who is of the armies. Ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, so what's happening here is uh, going to be they're going to use a fine detail point about the law as an illustration, and so Haggai is supposed to ask one of the priests in front of everybody uh, if one of you priests are carrying a bit of the holy meat, one of the sacrificial bits uh, in the fold of your garment, which they would do that as a a transport device. Uh, I don't know about you, but I know that I've used my shirt as uh, like a little pouch to carry things before when I didn't have something to use. So they were doing something like that. So if someone's carrying holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? So if the little pouch that you're using of your clothing uh, to carry this bit of holy meat happens to just bump up against something else that is food, Does that mean that that food becomes holy? And the priests answered and said, no. See, holiness is not transferred from one piece of food to another piece of food by that means. Verse number 13. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body, meaning they've just had a relative die, And so they've touched that body, and so now they are in an unclean state ceremonially. So if someone in that situation touches any of these food items or these other items, does it become unclean? And the priest answered and said, yes, it does become unclean. So little fine point of Jewish law, holiness is not transferred by touch, but unholiness or uncleanliness is passed by touch. Verse 14, Then Haggai answered and said, So it is with this people and with this nation before me, declares he who is, and so with every work of their hands. And what they offer there is unclean. So what they're doing is they are transmitting uncleanliness by what they're already engaging in. Verse number 15. Now then, consider from this day forward. Before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of he who is, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there was but 10. Now what is happening here is Haggai is getting back to his original thesis given to him by God. And that is the returnees are suffering under a drought. They're suffering under uh, the curse of God because they are not building the temple like they're supposed to be building. 
So the point in this passage is, you guys, by your activities in your life of ignoring the building of the house while you take care of all sorts of other business, you are actually transmitting unholiness into your day-to-day activities. Even though they are not sinful per se, the fact that you're not doing what you were told to do makes that stuff worthless. And so that's why you're getting judged with the curse. You're not getting everything out of the land that you should be getting out of the land if it were under God's blessing. So when you come to a heap of 20 measures of grain, what should have been 20 measures is only 10. When you come to a wine vat to draw 50 measures, there are but 20. So what could have been versus what real is, is because of the curse of God. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, Yet you did not turn to me, declares he who is. Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. So God first gets after them and says, you know what the problem is. Here it is. From the moment you guys came back and you laid that foundation, and and now it's about 16 or so years ago, you've had problems with the production of the land. And the reason you've had problems with it is because of me. But that can all change now since you are actually building the temple, if you will just let your heart follow through with what your hands are doing. Now on to verse 20, which is, this section is going to finish this little bitty book of Haggai, and then we'll shift over our attention to his partner in prophecy, uh, Zechariah. So the word of he who is came a second time to Haggai, in the 24th day of the month. So it's the same day, uh, just a different prophecy. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth and to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I am about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders. And the horses and their riders shall go down, every one by sword of his brother. Uh, So this is God letting Zerubbabel know that as the future comes, as time moves forward, God is going to start bringing judgment against all the different kingdoms of the world. Now, this is not going to all happen in a little bitty short period of time. It's going to be stretched out over time. And uh, Zechariah is going to actually have some of this uh, laid out as well. Uh, But the Jewish people are going to have a special promise made to them. And this particular leader is going to be representative of a greater leader that's yet to come. So that's going to be the point that this prophetic book ends on. Verse 23. On that day, declares he who is of the hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel. Uh, And remember, his name means sown in Babylon. I'm going to take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Sheltiel, declares he who is, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares he who is of the hosts. So Zerubbabel represents two things here. First of all, he is the leader of the Israeli people. The Israeli people were sown by God into Babylon as part of judgment against their sins. But with the promise that he would bring them back out of there to the Holy Land again, back to the promised land and reestablish them. And so that's happening right now. 
Zerubbabel is the leader of that first big group that came back. And there will be more and more groups come back over time. And the reestablishment of the Israeli people in the Promised Land is going to be the precursor of the coming of the Messiah, which brings us to the second thing that he represents. He is a direct descendant of Solomon. Zerubbabel himself cannot be king because there is a curse put upon the line of Solomon uh, that Zerubbabel comes from that no one from that line will ever sit upon the throne of Israel again. Never. But Zerubbabel does represent government. And there is the promise that there will be a branch from the line of David, from the stump of Jesse, that is going to arise. And he is going to be God's chosen one. He is the one that's going to act on God's behalf. He will have uh, the the scepter of the kingdom. Here, it's the reference to the signet ring, which was the the symbol of office, of leader. Uh, That future Messiah is going to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is going to be Yehoshua, uh, Hamashiach, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. Uh, And interestingly enough, Jesus is the adopted descendant of Zerubbabel. All you have to do is check the uh, genealogy of Joseph, the adopted father of Jesus, and you will see Zerubbabel in that line. Well, now let's leave behind uh, the prophecies of Haggai and focus our full attention on the prophecies of his compatriot, Zachariah. Uh, Zachariah, uh, the remembered one of God, the remembered one of Yah. Uh, We have already seen that he's calling for repentance at the time of the rebuilding of the temple. And uh, Zechariah chapter 1 verse 7 is where we pick up. On the 24th day of the 11th month, so a couple of months beyond the prophecy we just now saw, Uh, We're now in February of uh, 519 B.C. by our calendar system. So on the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of he who is came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Erechia, son of Edo, saying, I saw in the night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse horse. So, Zechariah has a night vision, and he sees a rider on a red horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in a glen. So, he's not in a city. He's down in like a covered uh, valley area with lots of myrtle trees, but he's not alone. It says, behind him were red, sorrel, and white horses. Now, immediately, when we start talking about four horses of different colors, a lot of people start going, the horsemen of the apocalypse. This this is the book of Revelation. And the answer to that is, no, it's not. (laughs) Uh, Imagery is similar, yes. But the application is specifically different. And uh, all you have to do is read the two passages Uh, And you can see that they are not about the same events. And so, uh, don't fall in to this knee-jerk sort of reaction that when you see similar uh, symbols, you automatically assume that they're the same. You have to do some research to see if there's a genuine congruence between the two of them. And there is not uh, between... Uh, these four horsemen and the four horsemen in the book of Revelation. So let's talk about what these guys represent, because it says it right here in the text. Verse number nine, Then I said, What are these, my Lord? 
the angel who talked with me said to me, I'll show you which they are. And so the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered, These are they whom he who is has sent to patrol the earth. That is, these guys on horses are supposed to go out and check on the situation in the world. So apparently these are angelic horsemen. And they are checking on the state of different ethnic groups, different nations. Verse number 11. Uh, They answered the angel of he who is, who was standing among the myrtle trees, and said, We have patrolled the earth, and behold, all the earth remains at rest. Now listen to that verbiage there. Uh, The earth is at rest. It's at peace. These nations they checked on have not had any trouble recently. That's going to come in to importance in a bit. Then the angel of he who is said, Oh, he who is of the hosts, how long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah against which you've been angry these 70 years? And so this is all tying back into the fact that Zerubbabel and Joshua and the almost 50,000 ethnic Israelis who have come to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, they are the first component coming back to Israel after the 70-year desolation of the Jewish nation. Uh, They had been in exile for 70 years since the first year of Nebuchadnezzar uh, until the first of them started coming back. And then the temple complex was destroyed and remained in desolation right up until this particular time period, which is almost 70 years after it was destroyed. Uh, So this is all tied into the return uh, according to the prophecies of God in the book of Jeremiah. Verse number 13. He who is answered gracious and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. So basically God says, it'll be all right. It's all on schedule. It's all going to happen like it needs to happen. Verse 14. So the angel who talked with me said to me, cry out. So here, here's what you as a prophet need to pass on. Cry out. Thus says he who is of the hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion. I am exceedingly angry with the nations that are at ease. See, that's the same thing as them being at rest a while ago. I'm exceedingly angry with the nations that are at ease, for while I was angry, but a little, they furthered the disaster. And we've talked about this before. While God used the Babylonians to judge the nation of Israel, they got out of hand in that judgment. In their free will operation, they went beyond what God really intended to happen for the Jewish people. So they need to uh, be judged for that. And God has already promised that they will be. And uh, by now in our history, uh, the Babylonian Empire has passed from the scene. Uh, Same thing with the Medo-Persians. They were used by God to carry out judgment and yet they went overboard in some circumstances and situations, and so uh, they need to be judged by God for what they did above and beyond what they were supposed to do. So here is the prophet Zechariah crying out at the direction of this angel for God to deal judgment against these nations that are currently at peace, at ease, according to the report of the horsemen. Verse 16, Therefore, thus says he who is, I have returned to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, declares he who is of the hosts, and the measuring line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. So God is affirming I am making sure that my promises happen according to plan. 
the temple building is being rebuilt according to my plan, and we're going to stretch out this measuring line over Jerusalem so it can be rebuilt as well. Verse 17, cry out again, thus says he who is of the hosts, my cities will again overflow with prosperity, and he who is will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. So this is a prophecy that even though at this particular moment in history, Jerusalem is an overgrown hill with bits and pieces of rubble here and there, uh, debris of burnt uh, wood. Uh, the temple is being built amidst this ruin, uh, and some of the cities are starting to be rebuilt. It doesn't look like much yet, but the promise of God is it's going to be completely revived again, and it'll be overflowing with prosperity, and God is going to make it a centerpiece of his activities. So this is a promise that his past promises will still be fulfilled. Verse number 18. I lifted my eyes and I saw, behold, four horns. Now, these are references to animal horns, which are symbols of strength. Uh, but they are also sometimes used as trumpets. So I'm not sure exactly what it is that he sees here, but he sees the symbol of strength. Verse 19, I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these? And he said to me, these are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. So these are the strong entities that have scattered the Israeli people as part of my judgment, but have gotten overboard about it. Verse 20, then he who is showed me four craftsmen, so four artisans that work in building projects. Remember, this is all happening while they're rebuilding the temple, so craftsmen are everywhere. Verse 21, and I said, what are these coming to do? So what are the craftsmen here to do? He said, these are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one raised his head, and these have come to terrify them to cast down the horns of the nations who lifted up their horns against the hand, the land of Judah to scatter it. Now, what's this prophecy about? It is demonstrative of the fact that the rebuilding of Jerusalem is a scary event for those that were involved in taking it down hard, especially since they went overboard. So this is a prophecy that's illustrating the, the long-term impact of the reestablishment of the Jewish people in their homeland uh, with the reestablishment of the capital city of Jerusalem, uh, the city of the great king the reestablishment of the temple. God's promises are coming back to life again. And that is scary to anyone that tries to stand against God's promises. Chapter number two. I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. So somebody that's getting ready to measure something. And I said, where are you going? And he said to me, to measure Jerusalem, to see what is its width and what is its length. So when you're rebuilding something, you kind of have to have a, a survey of the site, right? And so this guy is out there surveying the ruins of Jerusalem to see what's going to happen as it's being rebuilt. Verse 3. Uh, behold, the angel who talked with me came forward, and another angel came forward to meet him and said to him, Run, say to the young man, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls because of the multitude of people and livestock in it. Uh, so we've got a couple of different angels involved in here. And so one of the angels is supposed to run after the guy with the measuring uh, stick 
and say, hey, Jerusalem's going to be like a sprawling, unwalled area. It's going to be all over the place. It's going to be a lot bigger than what it used to be. And then verse 5, and I, remember this is God talking, I will be to her a wall of fire all around, declares he who is, and I will be the glory in her midst. Now, this is where we start understanding that the prophet Zechariah has a mixture of prophecies about the rebuilding of the temple, the rebuilding of Jerusalem, the reestablishment of the people of Israel in Judah, uh, but also things related to the first coming of Jesus, as well as things related to the second coming of Jesus and the eternal state of the kingdom of heaven, uh, where uh, Jerusalem is at the centerpiece of eternity, and there will be never any problems happen again. And so we've just got to pay attention to figure out exactly where in all of those prophecies we find ourselves. This one here seems to be one of the ones for eternity itself. That there is no need for a wall when God is the protection of the city. See, walls are intended for protection for the most part. But if God is taking care of the city, walls aren't needed. He is the wall. Verse 6, up, up, flee from the land of the north, declares he who is, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds of heaven, declares he who is. So here comes this call to the people still living up in exile. Hey, why don't you leave there and come south to Jerusalem? Come back to the land of the Jews. Come back to the homeland of promise. And the reason, at least in part for this, is because judgment will eventually fall upon the land of the north. 